Hi again. Uh, today is still Wednesday, and uh, we had a lot of stuff going on, so maybe just to explain to people who are watching the uh, beginning of Mass, and <clears throat> again, now, uh, the diocese ordered supplies for all the parishes. Uh, a mask, like these guys here, and hand sanitizer, big, big gallons with pumps. So like you see when you go to a hospital, if anyone's going to a hospital now, you have to pump your hand. So we're going to have that for the churches and places where people sanitize their hands. But they were told specifically to call us uh, 20 minutes before they got here. They did not. So they showed up at 5 to 12, at the beginning of Mass, and the other guy showed up at 10 after 12. Fortunately, we got it taken care of. And then at the same time, something went wrong with our internet connection, so we had a wait of time. So I apologize for being late for our Wednesday afternoon chat. Uh, today's been a pretty busy day. Uh, Bruce Trier, who runs the radio station, occasionally calls me up and says, Hey, you want to come in? So it's the uh, Dawn Patrol, which goes, I think, from 6 to 10. But I'm on for like 15 minutes, and we just talk about stuff. Uh, some of that I'll mention uh, in a few moments when we get to that part. Um, and everything else is going pretty well here in the parish. We got a lot of information, which you will get in the next mailing that we send out. Uh, it's also going to be uh, online. It's in the bulletin online. You can get it online on the bulletin. Uh, and we're probably going to put an ad in the local paper to explain what's happening and what's going on. Uh, a lot of people... Uh, may not read their mail. <laughs> People may not look at online for the bulletin. And one of the things is that we were asking for, we sent a letter to every registered parishioner to get email and phone, text, so we could do mass announcements. Uh, at this point, we have less than 200 returns out of uh, 1,620 households. So I plead with you, Please, if you haven't, please send that to us because it will really make it easier to us to get information out to you about what's going on. Uh, since we've been hearing so much about the uh, the uh, epidemic and the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918 uh, to 1920, I thought I'd just look it up, and this is just sharing some information about it. Then it seems that in that epidemic, uh, about 500 million people throughout the world were affected by it which was one-third of the world's population, which is tremendous. Today, uh, in the United States, they think, uh, well, in the United States then, probably 675,000 people died from the uh, Spanish flu. Uh, today, uh, there's just a guess about how many cases there are in the United States, but the number of deaths is uh, 84,000. And the Spanish flu, the, uh, the symptoms of the Spanish flu were sweating, uh, sore throat, uh, vomiting, uh, and eventually people got pneumonia, and that's, what, that's the final thing that they died from. Uh, the, the, uh, the Spanish flu, it got its name not because it came from Spain originally. The reason it's called the Spanish flu, at least this is the reason that's given, is that it, was, it broke at the end of the uh, First World War, and most of the country still had uh, great censorship on their, on their news on their radios, on their, uh, on their uh, newspapers. One of the countries that didn't, because it wasn't at the war, was Spain. And so Spain was rather free about putting information about what was happening in their country uh, with the flu on, into their newspapers. And so it just got to be called, for that reason, the, the uh, Spanish flu. Uh, where did it come from? Again, they're just guessing, but they think it came mainly from World War I that there were millions of young men who were living in these terrible conditions in the trenches with the mud and the dirt, the filth, uh, all the things that were there living close together, and that they, uh, they picked up these, these germs and passed them on to one another, and when they went back home, they began to spread the disease back home again. And the uh, striking thing about it was is that the Spanish flu especially attracted, it hit young, young people, uh, people between 20 and maybe into their 30s. Uh, not so much the older people, except if you're over 65 and, baby, and children under, under 5. And as far as remedies, there weren't many. Doctors didn't know what to do with it. In fact, most of the doctors were at war, so that the uh, flu was being tended by medical students and nurses. And uh, the only kind of real recommendations they could give, recommendations they could give were what we're doing today. To keep away from one another, to wear a mask, social, social uh, distance, and isolation. 
one of the things about that also is the uh, coming back when they open up society again at the Spanish flu time, it took a long, long time. In fact, the churches were not back to normal until two years after. It took a long, long time. Uh, hopefully that don't happen here with us, but it will take time. It's not going to be normal. So I want to uh, speak about a few of those things. We received a letter from uh, the bishop from the chassis office a few weeks ago about possible things to think about for opening up. And most of what all the bishops in the country are doing, there's a thing called the Thomistic Institute. Do you know where that comes from? Where it is? Thomistic yeah, Institute? Yeah. This, one of the universities has a Thomistic Institute. And it's a religious community. And they listed, I think it's like five or six pages of specifics of what to do. And each diocese is taken from that and creating their own uh, system. Some dioceses change the percentage of people that can go in. So right now, in this diocese, you can have Mass, but no more than 10 people. That's it. Other dioceses are allowed to have Mass, and they can have 25% of their normal occupancy. So right now, our uh, Vicar General is discussing uh, with the Governor about the possibility of moving ours up to 20 or 25 percent or 30 depending on the situation because it really makes no sense to have a public mass if you're only going to have 10 people there uh, on any regular basis particularly on the weekends so this is a letter that we got from Bishop Henning one of the auxiliary bishops and he said that they were all surprised by the governor's announcement that religious gatherings are allowed now with fewer than 10 people and they were surprised also that the governor mentioned outdoor uh, masses in cars, people in their cars. So we don't know how that's going to work. Uh, our church has been open from day one for personal prayer. And as always, we have signs, we tell people, no more than 10 people are allowed in church. And that's been pretty good. Uh, the bishop goes over, I go over, we look. Uh, there are people there every day. So in fact, every once in a while somebody actually sleep there. Um, but there's never been more than 10. Sometimes a whole family will come in. Uh, three or four of them will kneel up front and pray. And that's great to see. Um, the sacrament of penance has always been available, but now it's available for everybody, not just for serious sins, for anything. But at this point, we still need people to call make an appointment. Uh, we really can't have scheduled ones because of the lines and the room that we have. It's not appropriate with the spacing. Uh, hopefully we can work around that in the future. The anointing of the sick has always been available, is still available. Anyone seriously ill can always ask for that sacrament. Something new, funeral masses, weddings, and baptisms with immediate family, no more than 10 people are allowed. So it's the new 10-person rule. Um, funeral, weddings, and baptisms. So if you want to get married, you can always call and make an appointment. If you want your child baptized, call up and we can arrange for that. If you want a funeral, don't arrange for that. Don't die. Stay healthy. Uh, until further notice, though, Holy Communion is not allowed to be distributed, even when we have a funeral or a wedding. We don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, so the bishop has encouraged us to continue live streaming all our Masses and prayer events for those who are isolated and can't come to the events, even when we have a Sunday Mass, to keep doing that, which we've been doing for three years or more because Renee Stakey kind of encouraged me to do it. Some people say she forced me to. This is what the Bishop Henning would like us to say, and I'm going to read it. The decisions taken in March to restrict parish activities and liturgies were guided by concern for the common good and the protection of the vulnerable. The decisions that we've taken to resume worship and activities will be guided by that same concern for the common good and protection of the vulnerable. During the lockdown, our parish has provided burial prayers and outreach to baby families. Right now, we are relieved to resume the celebration of funeral masses for immediate family members. The same with baptism and weddings for small groups. We look forward to resuming weekday and Sunday masses. We respectfully ask for the patience of parishioners for the faithful, as we seek to do so with prudence and the same concern for the common good. So, the big question is, how would we handle our weekend masses? Uh, if we have a 25% capacity, we're going to have to work, struggle. If they allow a 30%, we're 
we have no problem because our church seats 550 and we never get more than 200 pretty much at any of the masses and with this happening now a lot of elderly people and the people who are sick or vulnerable won't be coming so we will not have a problem with that our problem will be uh, the mass at night where there are 700 people so we're going to have to either have different masses other times, mass in two places at the same time, different celebrants, but then we don't have the parking for that. So we have to figure that out. So I ask you to pray for us as we talk about that and try to figure that out. We may also have to stagger the mass times to allow time for cleaning in, be in between, which means Sunday morning mass, we may only have two and not three. All of these are ideas we have to discuss and figure out when we get the uh, directives. We do have already because I order them myself. We have uh, actually, uh, Teresa ordered them for me. We have uh, a couple of uh, quarts of spray uh, disinfectant. It's called the 301 or 103. It's used in the universities in the area. And you spray it on this uh, fiber cloth, microfiber, and you wipe it. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to scrub it. You don't have to wait an hour. So we have enough of that to get to two, two weekends. And uh, then we have to buy more. It's uh, $56 for those uh, 12 bottles, which is not bad, uh, but we'll have to be doing that. And uh, we also have uh, just received, as you heard, the mask and the other stuff. So we're in good shape. Hopefully, uh, I'm guessing by the 1st of July. Please go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping by July we'll be able to have masks with everyone you know, coming back. And hopefully soon after that, we'll be able to also... Uh, offer communion at the Mass, everybody. Thank you. I tried also to, to get some uh, information about what was happening locally during the uh, Spanish flu. Uh, not too much. Uh, at the time, there were three military encampments on Long Island. There was Camp Mills in Garden City, a Camp Upton, of course, in Yatbank, now Brookhaven National Laboratory, and uh, Camp Wyckoff out in Montauk, which was a naval air station. And uh, the information said that there were uh, 40,000, there could be 40,000 soldiers uh, spread in those, those places, and that there were field hospitals at, at Garden City and at Camp Upton, and that on one day in October 1918, there were 1,000 young men in one of the field hospitals. Uh, as far as uh, more local things, the news review, or, or it was called the counter review then, uh, spoke about uh, the, the uh, earliest local case uh, of this flu was of a, a young man named Milton Halleck, who was in the Navy. He wasn't here in Riverhead, but he, was, he came from Riverhead. He was in the Navy, and his parents were able to visit him. Uh, also, there was a, an interesting thing that said in Orient, uh, there was a, a, a letter written at the time by someone who was there saying that there were 100 cases of Spanish flu in Orient, and that a number of people were dying. Now, that's interesting, because uh, looking in Newsday today, the combination of people between uh, Orient and East Marion who have uh, this virus is uh, 28. So I don't know whether the population was greater then or just that uh, more people uh, were, were getting it, that the uh, even a small number of people were spreading very far. Uh, I, they were recommending then, uh, besides the, the social distancing and so on, they were recommending a gargle. And the gargle was uh, salt, baking soda, and uh, water, and then to gargle three times a day with that. So whether it worked or not, you don't know. <laughs> and finally, on a kind of a lighter note, uh, of course, one of the great music writers for America was Irving Berlin. Uh, we, we heard, he wrote hundreds of songs. We heard one of them a lot of times last week uh, for uh, Memorial Day, God Bless America, and if things had been okay, in Easter, we would have heard another one, Easter Parade, but he wrote a lot of songs, and one of the ones, he wrote a, a review uh, of, which he called Yip Yip Yap Pank, Yap Pank which was about uh, <laughs> life in, uh, Yap Pank was on, on Broadway, and if you'll excuse me, I'll just sing one of the very popular songs, uh, the chorus of it, that came from that, and it was, came popular also in the Second World War. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning, Oh, how I hate to get out of bed. 
Oh, the cruelest blow of all is when I hear the bugle call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up in the morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his reveille and stamp upon it heavily, and then I'll spend the rest of my life in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blow that bugle for me. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, listen, if you have any uh, concerns, questions, you can always uh, email us at the parish email or you can uh, do on Facebook, uh, send us some uh, stuff. Have a wonderful day. Hey, God bless.